Okay, so now we're actively recording right here. So usually what I do is I hit the... And it's not... There we go. Okay, so we are presumably recording this for Tegrity and for others to use and also to store so it's available. So uh, hair disorders, this is not the derm path hair disorder lecture, which we will do another time. This is purely clinical or largely clinical. Okay, this is the scene. It is Friday at 3 p.m. and these are the patients waiting for you at the end of the clinic. This is a scenario that strikes fear into the hearts of most dermatologists, um, but neither of these really should if you are simply prepared for the visit. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can keep talking. I think oh, you want to see the audio? Yeah. Make sure it's functioning. I think it is. It just goes well. Okay. That's okay. Uh, we now have, um, I think they're they're either up or they're coming next week, urticaria and alopecia smart sets that give you guidelines on tiered labs um, and, you know, when it's appropriate to order those labs and when it's not appropriate to order any labs. Um, as well as ordering medications, level of service, all of those things that you can do with smart sets. Remember that in the smart set, you can use any portion of the smart set. You are not committed to use all of these smart sets. So you don't have to use the note from the smart set. You don't have to, you can use any section and you can ignore any section if you don't want to use it in the smart set. Okay, so this is how to provide effective evaluation without losing your mind or staying till midnight. So rule one, define the goals of today's visit. What steps are you going to need to take today to get to your diagnosis? What are the important rule outs? Everything should be therapy based. You need to have questionnaires, overprinted exam forms, videos, handouts. It's very helpful if you are always asking the same scenario of questions, there should be a form. That the patient fills out so you are not there in the room spending that time with them you can then review it later on your on your own or more efficiently more quickly um, patients with alopecia have a large emotional overlay to the issue if you in one study that elise olson did the impact on patient rated impact on quality of life of alopecia is uh, scarring alopecia in a woman is equivalent to the impact of a new diagnosis of cancer in an individual. Um, interestingly, there have been a number of studies that show impact of a diagnosis of psoriasis is similar to that of diabetes. So just, you know, if you look at the relative impact on patients, um, scarring alopecia is uh, rated similar to diagnosis of breast cancer by the patients. Um, patients have also often been dismissed by numerous other providers. Um, the, they may feel the condition has been trivialized. Many of them will want to keep you in the office with them until their hair regrows. You need to be in control of the visit. This is one where you can't let the patient be in the control of the visit, where they give you a blow by blow, hour by hour since the process began. Um, you just you, you need to deliver efficient care and yet let them know you care about the problem and you're going to help them with the problem. So what are the most do's? Establish if there's a trichodystrophy, antigen or telogen effluvium, whether you're going to need a biopsy, whether you're going to need blood work. For biopsy, rule one, have gel foam in the clinic. In fact, we used to set up hair biopsy kits that are just a little punch biopsy kit with a piece of gel foam in there. Never suture a scalp biopsy again. It, you don't have to. It takes time. 
if you just use gel foam, you can hit a pumping arteriole. You know, it can be squirting blood up to the ceiling. You put gel foam in there, hold your finger on there for 20 seconds, it stops. You're fine. And the punch biopsy takes no more time than a shave on any other patient if you use gel foam. If you look at the healed wound, a sutured scalp site opens up, stretches, you know, just like the way uh, um, shoulder surgery, um, rotator cuff scar um, stretches, whereas a gel foamed one contracts to about half the size of the original punch. The scars look better or less noticeable after gel foam than after suture when evaluated at six months later. And then the last question is blood work needed. So trichodystrophy, are the hairs breaking? It is not exclusively our African-American patients, but more prevalent in that group, tenodosa. And they'll know whether it's coming out at the scalp or whether it's breaking. And you also look, is it thin at the scalp or is are there differences in hair length, which would be trichodystrophy? It's helpful to have a contrasting card, just have a three by five card, put dark paper on one side. If they have light hair, you use the dark side. If they have dark hair, you use the light side. Makes it easy to see hair shaft abnormalities. There are hair plucks and there are hair pulls. A hair pluck, you take a Kelly clamp with two Penrose drains, you take 50 hairs, and in a single motion, you yank them out of the scalp. Some patients resist this procedure. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a plucker because with a biopsy transverse section, you can get all of the antigen telogen ratios and things that you would get, and it's much more acceptable to patients in my experience. Um, there is also hair pull, and hair pull is you are just gently tugging through the hair to see what comes out. Do you have fractured antigen hairs? tapered fractures, as in alopecia areata, or do you have club hairs, telogen hairs, what's coming out? Or do you have loose antigen, as in loose antigen syndrome, but also as in active scarring alopecia? If you have an active LPP or lupus and you want to know, are you shutting it down or is it still active? If you are still have easily extractable antigen hairs in that area of lupus or LPP, it is progressive scarring alopecia. In that area so that's what Vera Price does to monitor her scarring is you know you just tug and see do you do the are the antigen hairs firmly rooted or does the inner root sheath just buckle and they come out if that happens you have not controlled the scarring alopecia there. so it's helpful for all of those things so on the left telogen club hair on the right antigen hair with the follicular sheath, it comes out with the follicular sheath, right? And the follicular sheath includes all layers, that's the citrulline stain, so you can see the inner root sheath surrounded by the outer sheath, and the whole thing comes out like a sock around the antigen hair in normal scalp. In diseased scalp or in loose antigen, you don't get the sheath with it. So this is what I affectionately refer to as the triker, the um, bezoar that the patient brings in, right? The paper bag bezoar. So the patient, um, they want to show you how bad their problem is. So they bring in the pillowcase or the paper bag full of all of the hair. And, you know, usually your first instinct is to say, yeah, thank you very much. I see that's a lot of hair. Yeah, you can keep that. Um, but there, there's a lot of information to be gleaned very easily from that. Take it and leave the room. So first off, they want you to take the bezoar. They will not be satisfied until you accept the bezoar. Take the bezoar, right? Then leave the room. If you are in the room with them, number one, they will be over your shoulder trying to show you things in there. Number two, no matter how much time you spend on it, it will not be enough if you're in the room with them, right? So you leave the room, you say, I'm going to take some time and look at this in the lab. You leave, see no fewer than three other patients before you return. 
to see that <laughs> person. It actually takes you about 30 seconds to look at the hair and glean the information you need, but um, you need to be out of that room for a requisite period of time before you return to that room. And in this case, we're just giving it a spaghetti toss on white paper, and you see there are some little fragments that come out, and this one happens to be Manilathrix, but um, you can see hair shaft disorder. And you look, if they have, if it's a woman with diffuse alopecia areata, you're going to see taper fractures. If it is telogen effluvium, it may shock you, but you're going to see telogen hairs, right? Um, so, and you can tell that very easily. So for those patients where you're really struggling, is it trichotillomania or is it diffuse AA? And the biopsy can be confusing there because they share catagen hairs and pigment casts. Just look at what they're shedding. Have them bring it in. If it's tapered fractures, it's alopecia areata. Right? I'm assuming they weren't on cancer chemotherapy. They would probably know that, right? Um, so then it's probably AA, which is the next most common, or actually the overall most common cause of a tapered fracture. If you see rumpled so cuticle, which means you have a soft hair cuticle, that's the pathogenesis of loose antigen syndrome. And you see it. Instead of pulling out the whole hair sheath, because the cuticles are interlocked, the cuticles are soft. So they just give way and rumple up, and you see that in the hairs. Telogen effluvium, the one you learned, which is I had a surgery three to five months ago, or I went on a crash diet three to five months ago, that is one form of telogen effluvium. So Terry Headington named these. I think the names are a little confusing, but I'll go through why he called them what he did. So early antigen release sounds to me like they're antigen hairs coming out of the scalp, right? That's not his concept. All of these, it's telogen hairs coming out of the scalp. Antigen is supposed to last how long? Three to five years, and then telogen lasts three to five months and then catagen lasts about three weeks. So years, months, weeks gives you antigen, telogen, catagen, or a thousand days, a hundred days, 10 days is close enough, you know, in terms of the relative lengths of time. So you've got lots of hairs that were supposed to be growing for a thousand days. You have a big body stress, is your body going to stop making blood, stop growing, lose weight, or just put more hair into resting phase? What? You are correct. Actually, it was the third. Um, you know, either through evolution or intelligent design, we are made so that during periods of stress, hair is expendable. Right? So are you going to make blood or are you going to make hair? I'm thinking if I were designing a human body, something that would survive, I would make it continue to make blood at the expense of hair, right? Um, so when there's a stress, you just take a lot of hairs and you put them into resting phase. A hundred days later, they're going to come out and sink, right? So that's your usual telogen effluvium. But there are things that cause delayed antigen release. When you are pregnant, the angels come down to your scalp and talk to all the hairs and say, okay, antigen hairs, if you're an antigen, you just stay an antigen. Telogen hairs, if you're in telogen, you don't come out of the scalp. You just stay in telogen and just stay in the scalp till this whole mess is over with. Nobody leave the room. No one stop what you're doing, right? So that means when you're pregnant, you have an abnormal elongation of antigen. And women will tell you, my hair grew longer when I was pregnant. You also don't shed telogen when you're pregnant. When your pregnancy ends, all of those abnormally prolonged telogens now come out and sink. And the patient comes to see you, I'm losing hair. The worst mm -hmm. thing to tell them is this is all going to be over in a month or so because they haven't even started to lose those abnormally prolonged antigens, which will be a second phase of shed, right? 
So there are two phases of shed. Um, they don't want to hear that there will be a second phase, but if you don't tell them about that, you're an even bigger quack because you told them it would get better, and now there's now it's getting worse. Right? You also will see women. This has happened a number of times. Women come in pregnant. Their mom, or more commonly their grandmother, is sending them in because they're shedding hair, and grandma says there's something wrong with the pregnancy. There's something wrong. And it's usually a threatened abortion. They're losing the baby, which is why they're starting to um, shed telogen and hairs while they're pregnant, because the pregnancy's coming to an end, basically. Um, early telogen release you get with minoxidil. So telogen hairs are supposed to last 100 days, and it is an active enzymatic release. It is not just that they get loose and then fall out. It is an active, enzymatically driven process that releases the hair. Minoxidil, by stimulating a new antigen, kicks off that release. So when you start using minoxidil, you will shed telogen hairs. So telogen hairs that should have been staggered out to 100 days are all going to start falling out. And people will see an increased shed. Well, I using this medicine because I want to grow hair, not because I want to lose hair. People abandon use because they don't understand that. Um, we talked about delayed telogen release in pregnancy, but you also see it seasonal. It's related to probably melatonin cycle. The further northern latitude you are, the less hair you shed in the winter, and then you have a spring shed, just like your collie dog. Right? Um, Patients don't like the collie dog analogy, by the way. Um, and then there are short cycles. So, um, you know the comedian Gallagher, the one who smashes the pumpkins? No, you guys are too young. Okay. So, he's balding, and for comic effect, he grows his hair long. And you can see he's got this long hair, and then he's short on the, on the top. When balding guys, pay attention to my hair as it starts to grow out at the end of the month. It's not getting any longer up here. It's just getting big on the sides, right? Why is that? Because this has a normal antigen cycle. This has a short antigen cycle, so it doesn't grow as long. If the normal antigen lasts a thousand days, this is tricky math here. Normal antigen lasts a thousand days. Telogen lasts 100 days. What is the normal proportion of antigen to telogen hairs in the normal human scalp? <laughs> like 10 to 1. Very good. They teach you well in the great state of Kentucky. So 10 to 1, which means 90% of your hairs are antigen, 10% are telogen. What if... Your antigen were shortened to 500 days. Now what's your ratio? And what if it gets shortened to like 250 days? Pretty much carry that ratio down to 400. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if if your ratio is five to one instead of ten to one, how many, how much more telogen shed will the para patient experience in a given month? About double, right? So why do young men say they're shedding their hair when they're going into pattern alopecia? Because they're short cycling. A shorter cycle means your more hairs are in telogen, which means you're going to have more telogen shed. Um, other things where you see short cycle is um, temporal alopecia, um, triangular alopecia. So triangular alopecia. You have miniaturized hairs with a short cycle and a telogen shed. Antigen effluvium. Antigen effluvium is like a Bose line in the nail. In the nail, if you go on chemo, you get a ridge, a depressed ridge in your nail, a Bose line. Now, make that a hair shaft. It is going to be a circumferential narrowing of the hair shaft down to like a pencil point. If it narrows enough, it snaps, right? So if it doesn't narrow that much, it's called a pole pincus deformity. You see people who've been on cycles of chemo, 
and the hair narrows like an hourglass, goes out, and the hair goes out, that's pulpincus. Major pulpincus deformity is alopecia areata or chemo, where it comes down to a tapered fracture. If you see people on chemo, are they totally bald? Or do they have about 10% of their hair just as long as it was? It's always the second one, right? So why? Because is chemo going to affect A, a growing hair, or B, a hair with no matrix that's not growing, it's just sitting there in telogen? So it affects 90% of your hairs, which are the ones that come out, which were the ones in antigen. Whereas the telogen hair, it doesn't have a growing matrix. There's nothing for the chemo to affect, right? Alopecia areata, instead of being a chemical insult, it is an inflammatory insult to the hair matrix. Syphilis is an identical inflammatory insult to alopecia areata, and you see tapered fracture in syphilis the same way. And then you see it in heavy metal ingestion like phthalate. Okay, so we talked about trichodystrophy, antigen telogen. Next is, is a biopsy going to be needed? If they're scarring alopecia, the answer is yes, it's going to be needed. Why is it needed? Because you want to know, does the patient have lupus or not? Because if they have lupus, you're going to start them with Plaquenil. And if they have anything else that's scarring, you're not going to start them with Plaquenil. So which ones are you going to treat differently from scarring alopecia and OS? You're going to treat lupus differently. You're going to treat folliculitis to Calvin's differently. And so those are the ones you're really biopsying for. It almost doesn't matter if it's LPP versus scarring alopecia NOS because those are going to be steroids up to cell sap, depending what you need to do for the patient. Um, the ones that you're going to manage differently are going to be folliculitis to Calvin's, where you're going to target staph neutrophils inflammation and um, lupus, where you have other drugs like Plaquenil that you would bring in earlier. Plaquenil and LPP, by the way, um, three good studies that show it reduces erythema and does not stop the progression of hair loss. So if you're telling Mrs. Smith, I could give you these anti-malarial pills, and they would make you less red, and you would continue to lose hair. What do you think she's going to say? which is why I'm not a big proponent of anti-malarials in the setting of LPP. Whereas in lupus, Plaquenil can be very helpful. So it's a different equation. And things like Dapsone that you wouldn't really think of for LPP, but in discoid LA lesions can be very efficacious. So, you know, it management's a little different. So scarring alopecia, yes, you need to do it. If you're using gel foam, it's no big deal. That's where the money is. Just get on with it, right? Non-responsive alopecia areata. You think it's AA, and it's non-responsive biopsy because about twice a year in New York and Pennsylvania, we would see undiagnosed metastatic breast or sometimes renal, usually breast, in the scalp, alopecia neoplastica, which clinically the clinician thought was alopecia areata, but it's not regrowing hair, right? Um, the other thing is sometimes you will see a lupus paniculitis that clinically it doesn't look like lupus. It just looks like AA, but on biopsy, it's clearly lupus. So um, Diffuse alopecia areata, there may be reasons to biopsy to establish that diagnosis. Moth-eaten alopecia with negative serology, either prozone or HIV to rule out syphilis. And then trichotillosis, which is the politically correct term for trichotillomania. So this person has alopecia areata. I know it, you know it, the elevator operator knows it, right? This person, it's a little more diffuse, a little patchier. There might be a question. This person has a very diffuse alopecia. What's the clue? First off, what color hair does this patient have? I'd say it's salt and pepper. Why is it only salt in patches? What's the antigen in alopecia areata? The antigen is melanocyte. It is not hair matrix. The hair matrix is an innocent bystander. In tissue explant models, the melanocyte is what induces the immune response. 
So what gets hit first in AA? The pigment, right? And non-pigmented hairs are the last things to get hit. So if you're salt and pepper, you will, the pepper falls out and the salt is relatively spared. And so that's a clue to the diagnosis of alopecia areata. People who had the biggest fright in their life and their hair went white overnight, they were salt and pepper and they get alopecia totalis. Right? Um, history tells us Joan of Arc went white overnight, some kind of stress in her life, something about being burnt, and then she develops alopecia totalis and white overnight. So, so it goes white because you were salt and pepper and all the pepper falls out. You had, white hair. You had a gray. mix of white and dark hair. Your dark hair is now gone, leaving you only with white hair because the lymphocytes aren't that interested in the white hair. They're interested in the dark hair. Does that make sense? And you also see there are well-documented cases of migratory poliosis that on biopsy are alopecia areata. The insult wasn't enough that you lost hair, just enough that the hair goes white or red, or various strange colors. You have people who come in with blotches. They look like clowns. They have blotches of red hair because pheomelanin does not induce the... You don't see a lot of redheads with alopecia areata. Pheomelanin is not an efficient antigen. It's usually eumelanin that's inducing it. And um, you'll see people who have weird... Their hair turned red. Well, they may have processed it and done something. or there are cases of alopecia areata like that. This is another patient with a salt and pepper and losing some areas where they're losing everything, but certainly preferentially attacking the pepper. And another, you know, they all look similar. Um, this guy was told he was just going bald, um, but does baldness have a scalloped rim? This is a clearly a corymbiform pattern, right, where you have multiple circles merging um, like an umbler for a plant. So um, that suggests either syphilis or alopecia areata as a diagnosis. And another one, you know, again, you've got that patchy pattern. If you look, you can see the, um, the broken off hairs, the exclamation point hairs. It's the lower part of the retained part of that tapered fracture. And then that is a tapered fracture, which looks like a tapered fracture, a pencil point. It's not, you know, and if you um, look at the collected hairs and that's what you see, you know, there's an antigen of fluke. So this is a um, patient. We had a wonderful, wonderful resident, Catherine Zarnick, great bedside manner. Everyone loved her. I got the nastiest letter I've ever received from a patient about what a horrible physician she was. And so, you know, I called this person to find out you know, what's going on here. And um, she, she had a rough life. She had gotten divorced early because she developed alopecia areata. And she had, you know, whether that did it or just her emotional reaction to it, but the marriage dissolved. And she had horrible bouts of alopecia totalis when she was young. And then in her 40s, she developed this platinum blonde hair that was the envy of all her friends. So she's now salt and pepper, and, she's, and it's back, right? She came in to see Catherine because there was this mousy, dark areas showing up in her beautiful platinum blonde hair. Catherine accurately diagnosed alopecia. Shariata started her on treatment. She was getting mousier and mousier as the pigmented hairs were regrowing, getting madder and madder. We withdrew all therapy. She was happy as a clam, brought in a cake to the clinic. And, um, this is another patient, salt and pepper, and mainly salt. Okay, is this person salt and pepper? I'd say not really. So why do they have sudden poliosis? Well, could be vitiligo, it could be a congenital area of leukoderma, or we trim it and it is melanoma under the scalp. So if they're not salt and pepper, then the white is not alopecia areata. You know, look for another cause of pigment.
Um, this is typical moth-eaten alopecia of syphilis. This is typical trichotillomania with the peripheral spared fringe. The patient had been asked many times, are you pulling your hair? No. I'll stare you down. No. Ask it differently. When did you start pulling your hair? When my parents said we had to leave Florida and move to Texas. I saw the sign that said, welcome to Texas. That's when I started. She also, she is controlling the entire family. So every morning, the school bus comes up. She projectile vomits all over the kitchen. And it, she doesn't go to school. And mom is late to work. And the house smells like vomit every day. So trichotil is a compulsive behavior. Along with trichotillomania comes trichophagia. That is the very real bezoar in her stomach, which is the reason she's projectile vomiting. Is That's the big emesis basin, by the way. Um, so the idea of swallowing a hair is repulsive to most people, right? So Seinfeld does a routine where, you know, you stroke hair, you kiss hair, but the moment it detaches from the scalp and falls in your salad it is now the most disgusting thing on earth, right? Um, and for most of us, you know, you're digging into a nice crisp salad in a restaurant and you find a hair. For most of us, that's the end of the meal. For these patients, it is but the beginning of the meal, right? Um, here, you can see areas that look almost um, like parigo, sometimes areas of hemorrhage, and you can see what look almost comedonal. Those are very thickened hairs. If you look at anyone who's got parigo or lichen simplex chronicus, the hair becomes thick and dark in that area from the repetitive minor trauma. This kid, you look at the scalp, what color is the kid's hair? Light. Why is it so dark there? Because there is an element either of LSC or of trichotil going on there causing the thickening and darkening of the of the hair. Okay, where to biopsy? And I'm afraid this is going to take up the whole hour. Um, what is worth doing? So you want an active lesion. And if anyone was taught, like I was during residency, the active advancing border, that is not what you want to biopsy. What you want to biopsy is probably about four or five millimeters in from that. What you want is not the active advancing border, where path is always nonspecific. What you want is a well-established lesion of at least four months duration, but still inflammatory. So you can several millimeters in the area of alopecia, not into the heart. Correct. Or, or more. Yeah. As far into the area as alopecia as you can go and still find it inflamed. Okay. Um, and even burnt out scar, which I was taught never to biopsy because you just see scar. Um, with an elastic stain, you actually see diagnostic patterns. So. That can be helpful. So this is a woman who was in a car accident. She needed vasopressin for blood pressure support. She developed vasopressin-induced scalp necrosis. We know why she had it. The biopsy is being done to, before a scalp reduction to see does she have potential for hair regrowth, where are they going to end their scalp reduction, right? But the exercise we're going to do, look at that collagen there. Does it look any different from this collagen here? So I'm going to start at the top, and I want you to raise your hands when you think we're at the end of the scar. So raise your hand when you're sure we're at the end of the scar. I see people thinking somewhere in there, right? With an elastic stain, it's right there. Right? That scar. That's not scar, because mm -hmm. it still has elastic. These are the fibrous tract remnants. That's the area of the bulge. This is where the regenerative epithelium would be. This area cannot grow hair, but that area can. So we don't want to do scalp reduction in this area because she has scarring that hovers right around the bulge. Give her some time. She may regrow a lot of hair in that area. But the patterns of scarring differ in different types of alopecia. So lupus is kind of side-to-side -side scarring. Folliculitis decapens and LPP are sniper fire, little wedge-shaped scars. 
and the patterns are totally different. Even in the burnt out scarred like alopecia, you see the footprint of the condition. And if what you're trying to do is differentiate, am I going to treat this like lupus or treat it like LPP because that's my differential, the burnt out area with an elastic stain can give you that answer. So this would be that kind of patient where I'm pretty sure this is LPP. I can see those little silver spines at the base of the hair. So I'm 99% sure this is LPP, but I want to make sure that I can't use Plaquenil or something else in this patient or that I need to look for other signs of lupus. Um, so if a biopsy, I see some erythema in there. That's probably where I'm going to biopsy, but there may be some benefit to biopsying right there in the scar because that'll actually tell me lupus versus LPP pretty easily just by the elastic pattern. You have bundled hairs here. So how do you know this couldn't be a burnt out folliculitis to Calvin's? Folliculitis to Calvin's, you tend to have bundles of six or more hairs, whereas in LPP, you have bundles that are only two to three hairs. Lymphoid scarring alopecia gives you small bundles. Separative alopecia gives you big bundles. So you can tell those apart. And then the little spine, silver spine at the base, is typical for LPP. A little closer. Look at that. So two four millimeter punches parallel to the direction of hair growth. Unless you're Herman Munster, your hair doesn't come straight out of your scalp, it comes at an angle. Put the punch in at the same angle so you're not transecting follicles. Um, one bisected transversely, one vertically works very nicely. Tell the lab what you're doing, just have a, you know, write it right on the form. So this is what you would do for, for that, is you would take two punches, cut one a millimeter above the fat transversely, cut the other one vertically. This half goes for IF. All three pieces go into one bottle, so you're not increasing the path charge to the patient. And it gives us vertical plus transverse in the same patient. So this is what it looks like embedded. You've got your transverse and your vertical. They're really nice for teaching, and for things like lupus, you've got your DE junction, follicular plugging, basic membrane zone thickening, lupus paniculitis, all things which you cannot see on the transverse sections. Um, so the benefits transverse, you see all the hairs, but you only see them at one plane of section. Vertical, you see everything from DE junction down to fat. So there's things like this that you wouldn't see in transverse. And that's LPP with all the Sabat bodies up high. LPP is the diagnosis most likely to be missed by transverse only sections. And there are a lot of studies that show that, which is why at Penn they do the Hover technique where they do transverse, but before they do that, they cut off the top of the specimen and do that vertically because they're looking for LPP in those vertical sections. And these are all LPP patients, giving you an idea of the spectrum of what it can look like. If they all had lichen planus in the mouth, it would be nice because you wouldn't have to do the biopsy. Right? Um, that's also LPP. That's also LPP. That's also, this is like classic, as classic as it gets with the silver spines at the base of the hair, bundles of only two to three hairs. LPP. This is LPP, disseminated all over the body. This is a form of LPP. This is the frontal fibrosing alopecia. If you look at it close up there, it looks just like other LPP, except that the hairs become kinky and curled like pubic hair. And the patients describe it that way. I mean, they're starting to look like pubic hairs, the way they kink up. So Elise Olson went, hmm, they're looking like pubic hairs. I wonder if finasteride would do anything. It didn't. So then she said, I wonder if Avidar, Dutasteride, would do anything. It did. 40% of the patients at least. In the Spanish data, 60% of the patients stops progression of disease um, with you know, minimal morbidity. Um, so Avidar, Dutasteride is considered by many to be first-line treatment of choice. Um, PPAR inhibitors, Actos. Um, 
works in a similar percentage maybe to shut down any variant of LPP. It's worth a trial. If it hasn't worked by six months, abandon it. Don't let them go on to an insidious continuing loss. Just go to Cellcept if you failed those things. Um, but And this is that generalization of the hair. Is that only in frontal Only fibrosing? in frontal fibrosing, no. no other type of LPP. And while PPAR inhibitors can work in a smattering of any type of LPP, dutasteride only works in frontal fibrosing. And it was no more complicated than Elise being told by the 10,000th patient, these are looking like pubic hairs, and she thought, I wonder if something hormonal might work. Right? And that's, you know, closer look. But the other features look like LPP at the base of the hair, the little silvery spines. And this is another frontal fibrosing, but it's all over. I mean, every biopsy, the whole body was like that, and the whole body was LPP. And she was losing, she's basically going to a green little Picardy. You can see she's already painted on her eyebrows, and she just has total body like in Plano Pilaris. And that's close up to this one. Cells have very reliably. Yep. I mean, that's, if the other things have, you know, you always start with topical steroid, intralesional. Biggest problem with topical steroid is your scalp. You know how scalps bleed? Even if not a deep wound, just a, a last, you know, your kid bumps their head. They just bleed all over the place. Scalps are highly, highly vascular. If you induce atrophy with a topical steroid, scalps look red. They look really, really, really red. And the patient thinks it's still inflamed. And the clinician thinks it's still inflamed. It's just atrophy that you're looking at. And the more steroids you use, the redder it's going to get. Look with your dermatoscope. You'll see what you're looking at is your subpapillary plexus of vessels rather than real erythema. And that's just scalp erythema from atrophy and visualization of the vessels, not from untreated disease. You know, your antigen pull has gone away. Histologically, there's no inflammatory disease. You just continue to make the scalp more and more atrophic and redder and redder and redder. Sure. Do you just plan on having them on steroids for forever? Is that what you No. You know, when you follow these patients, they do burn out in several years, but it burns out with pretty significant morbidity. So um, we're going to have it, them on it until we shut it down. And then how do you know when it's time to try to take them off when you no longer have a positive antigen pull? So I no longer have erythema that's real erythema. I no longer have um, a positive antigen pull, then it's time to try tapering them, try just steroids, something less aggressive, get them off therapy altogether. Because you can shut it down. I mean, some of the Actos patients stay shut down for years after six months of Actos. So. Um, Correct. I, I'm usually, like, um, if they're going to be on Cellcept, three to six months. Okay. And if Actos hasn't worked in six months, abandon it, go on to the next treatment. I mean, Wilma, <coughs> because she gets people who failed everything sequentially, she then adds them together, right, because no one has done that. They've tried everything separately, but they've never put things together. Um, so that most of her patients are on multiple. I'm seeing them de novo most of the time. If someone comes to me as a failure from someone else's therapy, I'll combine regimens. But um, usually they've diagnosed a scarring alopecia. They're going to send the patient right to me. They're not going to manage them in their practice because they take too much time. And... Um, so there I will do it sequentially. Okay, down to the last one, the question of blood work. So if it's trichodystrophy, no labs, unless it's tapered fractures and you're worried about syphilis, in which case the only lab you want is an RPR, right? If it's an antigen effluvium, or if what you're seeing are antigen hairs, not tapered fracture, then you're worried about a scarring alopecia, but labs are not going to be a benefit there. Right. 
increase shed that is diffuse where there's no obvious where there's an obvious cause of telogen loss and that obvious cause can be sebderm psoriasis papulosquamous disease will trigger a telogen effluvium it can also be that they had their big surgery three months ago you're probably not going to find anything but if it's going on too long or there's no obvious cause look at the things that are low cost high yield if it is a woman who is menstruating iron deficiency is common right? if I were designing a body would I make it make blood or would I make it grow hair you're gonna make blood at the expense of hair the most sensitive test is the saturation if your saturation is below 20 percent you are iron deficient ferritins are first off they're an acute phase reactant so if you have rheumatoid arthritis you can have profound iron deficiency if you have rheumatoid arthritis you have a normal ferritin because it's an acute phase reactant so all the rooms know that ferritin is worthless in their RA patients because they're all high or normal even if they are iron deficient it just it's an acute phase reactant so that's the problem with ferritin um, notice CBC is nowhere on this list because you're going to lose hair way before you become hypochromic micro microcytic saturation is the single best study um, you also need to find out what their diet is so ferritins are if you have a ferritin um, that is 50 or higher with a Western diet you have bone marrow that is replete with iron but if you look at most of the world or half of some half of central New Jersey where the population is vegetarian of you know actually the population there is 60% South Asian half of them are Indians and veg vegetarian the others are Pakistani and those patients say all we eat is meat <laughs> Um, so you know you have two South Asian populations one that eats a lot of meat and one that often eats none if you look at the ones that eat none their ferritins are not 50 and yet they you know they may or may not be iron deficient and much of the world walks around with lower um, lower ferritin levels saturation is a better measure so saturation below 20 percent equals um, a benefit to iron replacement in that patient and you need to know what their what is their cultural norm and also what's acceptable to them because you tell them well I want you to eat meat at least four times a week and they're vegetarian it's not going to happen because that's repulsive to them so you know you need to know what their cultural norm is and what they what they eat um, by the way a lot of Western disease probably relates to our diet to, um, to include breast and uterine cancer and other things um, how how often do women menstruate in the United States monthly how many periods do women have in most of the world where they don't have a Western diet you know in areas that where people live the way human beings evolved six or fewer periods a year you have raging hormones and cycling in the West because we eat diets that are too rich and there um, there's evidence that you're probably healthier and better off on a seasonal pill than on a birth control pill that makes you cycle monthly because cycling monthly is what all the companies did to present it to the FDA because it was normal cycle not normal cycle the way human beings evolved normal cycle the way human beings evolved is probably four times a year um, so you know just to keep all that in mind of what's normal what's not normal in relation to diet etc um, TSH if you were born female you have a 5% chance of having thyroid disease sometime in your life it often presents with hair disorder and a TSH is dirt cheap so you know really easy good screen and we are just about out of time so we're almost done so that's the data on 
ferritin. Um, 20 is most of the world. This is normal ferritin in most of the world, not the 50 that we use. Um, increased shed that's patchy, look for papulosquamous disease, scale. Um, diffuse or chronic if they're tapered fractures, that's a hint to look for an RPR. If they have a pattern alopecia, look for reversible causes of a superimposed telogen effluvium because that will make people shed earlier. If you have pattern alopecia, where you were destined to be bald by 50, but you have telogen effluvium, every, so I was born with a hand of cards. When my hand of cards is played out, I'm bald. Each hand is a antigen cycle. Every telogen effluvium shortens my hand, right? And so you go bald earlier. Um, my dad grew up during World War II. He was bald by 18. Why? No food, right? So people, you have twins. One has had health issues. The one, the other hasn't. The one with health issues is bald way earlier than his twin brother because um, he's lost hair cycles. If you have a woman with pattern alopecia, you can give her spironolactone. You can do things like that to regrow hair, and you can do topical minoxidil but also look at things that are stealing hair cycles from her and make sure you correct that. So that just gives you a ins little insight to why I order some of the labs that I order in clinic when we're dealing with alopecia patients. And that's it. Time to go to clinic today. Thanks, sir. I'm sorry. Yes. So most of the patients are women, like how do you 